Hello? Check. That better? Great. Everybody hear me? One of the oldest rules in sound design is that the most realistic sound is often the most boring. In the same way that an animator squashes and stretches to bring life to a character, sound designers heighten and exaggerate to bring out a sense of personality. And if you want a masterclass in some of the most creative cinematic mixing, look no further than the folks at Pixar, who've been weaving together stories of sound since the very beginning with the first Toy Story. Toy Story's sound design was due to this man, sound designer Gary Rydstrom, who's been with the studio since their earliest days when he helped imbue a couple of desk lamps with life and emotion. That's any sound designer's MO, and it's one of Rydstrom's great talents, instilling a sense of personality within each and every character that defines them but doesn't distract from the big picture. It never runs roughshod over the dialogue. Watch where you're going! Sorry! Even the most bizarre character sound feels completely natural. It's almost subliminal in that respect. You don't really think about it when you're watching the movie, but it's so baked in and utterly a part of the film's DNA that it's hard to imagine these characters sounding any differently. Draw! A big part of the success of Toy Story's sound comes down to the cooperation and balance Rydstrom brought between, on one hand, more realistic effects, sounds that are more mechanical, weighted, and even tangible, with a more traditional cartoony style that harken back to the classical Disney days of using a musical catalog of sound, where you hear a cymbal clash when a character hits their head, or a snare drum for a passing train, there's a great sense of balance between the two camps. So on one hand, a character like Slinky sounds exactly as you'd expect a Slinky dog to sound. But the little tyke's firemen squeak like the Jawas from Star Wars. And both make perfect sense. Or take the deformed toys in Sid's room, who sound even more cartoony and exaggerated than Andy's toys. The effect of which serves to make them all the creepier. Or think of a moment like this where Woody and Buzz get into a fist fight. You want a piece of me? It's the beeps and boops and squeaks of the two toys that keeps the scene from going overboard and feeling too violent. Buzz, buzz, buzz. But the most impressive thing Rydstrom brought to the film, I think, was a precise sense of scale. And he's pretty much a master of scale. After all, he's the one who designed this. Because so much of the movie is seen from the toy's point of view, Rydstrom engineered the sound to fit their perspective. That's why a shower of pushpins sounds like a rain of arrows. A bulletin board creaks and groans as it falls. And a rolling globe sounds like the giant boulder from Indiana Jones. Andy's room constitutes an entire world for these tiny toys, therefore it feels like an entire world. And because of that, any location outside of it feels all the more massive and frightening. You know, the first Toy Story isn't that big of a movie. There's something like only four locations throughout the entire film. And yet, I think the original sells this idea of massive scale better than any of the sequels. And the reason for that is that the sound, rather than the score, is more often than not the thing creating so much of any given scene's atmosphere. And again, Rydstrom did that by balancing the literal with the subjective. For Scud, Rydstrom alternated between actual dog sounds, and at his most menacing, the sounds of lions, elephants, and a few of the dinosaur roars he ported over from Jurassic Park. The effect of which turns Scud into a monster. 
The claw and pizza planet feels surgical and menacing. Look out! And if you close your eyes during the climactic chase, you'd swear you were listening to a scene out of Mission Impossible. It's that sense of exaggerated scale that helps the film really sell moments where the perspective switches back and forth between the toys and the human characters. In fact, that kind of perspective switching is something of a recurring motif throughout the film, usually accomplished by building up music effects and dialogue between the toys louder and louder, and then cutting to near silence when one of the human characters enters a room. It's a simple and effective technique that keeps the mix from being overloaded and manic, but it's also just one of the easiest ways to create a sense of tension. But here's my favorite thing that Gary Rydstrom brought to the movie. That concept of perspective switching is further seen in the movie on a micro level so subtle that, again, a word I've used already, it's practically subliminal. T-O-Y. Boy. Excuse me, I, I think the word you're searching for is Space Ranger. Consider Buzz Lightyear's arc across the film, growing from delusions of grandeur to embracing the reality that he is in fact a toy. When we first meet him, he's convinced he's the real deal. And to depict that, the sounds we hear from him are heightened to an even further extent. His POV shot features Darth Vader-style breathing. There's a jet engine roar layered into the mix when he's flying. And even the first time his helmet retracts, it sounds much more mechanical, like some bit of tech from Star Wars. And all of this is in service of getting into his head and depicting what he believes to be reality. The air isn't toxic. He doesn't believe he's a toy, so he doesn't sound like a toy. But that moment of realization eventually comes, and when it does, the sound mix subverts all that we've heard with the character up to this point. We've heard him fly already, but here in Sid's house when he falls, all we hear is the crunch and munch of plastic, the first time that he's actually sounded like a toy, the perfect counterpoint that supports and strengthens his terrible awakening to reality. Great sound design doesn't have to be hidden and subliminal like this. The folks at Pixar have made films that exist on both ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between, but I think it's worth praising them for treating sound in a more layered storytelling capacity right from the start. When people talk about sound design, what they're often actually talking about is whatever sound jumps out at them the most, whatever's aggressive, bizarre, or just loud. But sometimes the best work flies under the radar. And I think Gary Rydstrom and his team's work is a great lesson in just how much sound can bring out an incredible sense of nuance. The next time that you rewatch Toy Story or any of Pixar's other gems, close your eyes and take a moment to just listen to a scene you may have seen a dozen times before. You might hear something in it you've never heard before. Thank you guys so much for watching. This video is brought to you by Skillshare, an online learning community with thousands of classes on topics like illustration, design, photography, and so much more, all taught by experts and professionals. If you've been watching my channel for a little while now, then you probably know that I'm constantly trying to push the look of each video. I always want the animation and the motion graphics to look better and cleaner, and to do that requires constantly learning new skills. If you're like me and you felt thoroughly intimidated by Photoshop, I'd highly recommend checking out Libby Vanderplug's class on creating animated illustrations. It's an absolute wealth of knowledge. Check it out. Whether you're a beginner or a professional, Skillshare is an invaluable resource. And right now, the first 1,000 people to use the link in the description box below will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership.